praise God, praise the Lord. Oh, give thanks to the Lord for he is good, for his loving kindness is everlasting. Who can speak of the mighty deeds of the Lord or can show forth all his praise? Our Savior desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord and he will have mercy on him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. Make me walk in the path of your commandments for I delight in it. Incline my heart to your testimonies and not to covetousness. Turn away my eyes from looking at worthless things and revive me in your way. Establish your word to your servant who is devoted to fearing you. Amen. To him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. If you love me, keep my commandments. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. It is good to give thanks to the Lord and to sing praises to your name, O Most High. of the week. Um, Can you say it? Cast your cares of the Lord and he will sustain you. And, and he will never let the light just fall. Good job. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> Psalm 55, 22. Cast Cast your cares on the Lord, and He will sustain you. He will sustain you. Cast your cares on the Lord, and He will sustain you. He will sustain you. And He will never, never, never let the righteous fall. Let the righteous fall No He will never, never, never let the righteous fall Let the righteous fall No Cast your cares on the Lord Cast your cares on the Lord, and He will sustain you. He will sustain you. And He will never, never, never let the righteous fall. Let the righteous fall. No, He will never, never, never let the righteous fall. Let the righteous fall. No. Psalm fifty five twenty two. Cast your cares on the Lord, and He will sustain you. He will sustain you. I said, Cast. 
on the low He will sustain you He will sustain you King will never, 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 never let the rise on the low Let the rise will sustain you No said King will never, 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 never let the rise on the low Let the rise will sustain you Epistles this year, a uh, yearly cycle. Today we are going to be reading uh, Hebrews uh, chapter 11. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good testimony. By faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. By faith, Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and through it he, being dead, still speaks. By faith, Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death and was not found, because God had taken him. For before he was taken, he had this testimony that he pleased God. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. By faith, Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household, by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness, which is according to faith. By faith obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance. And he went out, not knowing where he was going. By faith he dwelled in the land of promise, as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. By faith Sarah herself also received strength to conceive seed, and she bore a child when she was past the age, because she judged him faithful who had promised. Therefore from one man, and him as good as dead, were born as many as the stars of the sky in multitude, innumerable as the sand which is by the seashore. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For those who say such things declare plainly that they seek a homeland. And truly, if they had called out to mind that country from which they had come out, they would have an opportunity to return. But now they desire a better, that is, a heavenly country. Therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said, In Isaac your seed shall be called, concluding that God was able to raise him up, even from the dead, from which he also received him in a figurative sense. By faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau concerning things to come. By faith, Jacob, when he was dying, blessed each of the sons of Joseph and worshipped, leaning on the top of his staff. By faith, Joseph, when he was dying, made mention of the departure of the children of Israel and gave instructions concerning his bones. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden three months by his parents because they saw he was a beautiful child and they were not afraid of the king's command. By faith, Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasure in Egypt, for he looked to the reward. By faith, he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. By faith, he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, lest he who destroyed the firstborn should touch them. By faith, they passed through the Red Sea as by dry land, whereas the Egyptians, attempting to do so, were drowned. 
By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they were encircled for seven days. By faith, the harlot Rahab did not perish with those who did not believe when she had received the spies with peace. And what more shall I say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah, also of Dan David and Samuel as the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, worked righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, became valiant in battle, turned to fight the armies of the aliens. Women received their dead, raised to life again. Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. Still others had trial of mockings and scourgings, yes, and of chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn too, were tempted, were slain with a sword. They wandered about in sheepskin and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains, in dens and caves of the earth. And all these, having obtained a good testimony through faith, did not receive the promise. God having pro provided something better for us, that they should not be made perfect apart from us. <clears throat> all right, so let's see now how well we were <laughs> So, what did Abraham do? He offered a more excellent sacrifice. He spoke boldly about God. He raised me. He offered a more excellent sacrifice. Okay. Abraham had to do what? He had to travel to a strange land, learn scripture, build a tent. mentioned by name, Samson, Jeremiah, Jephthah, or Barak? And the answer was uh, Jeremiah, although it does mention prophets as a whole, but not specifically Jeremiah by name. All right, so <clears throat> we, are, uh, we have a few out today, so you're hearing my voice a lot, so hopefully you like it. The dulcet tones of Daniel Kaplan. Um, <laughs> um, I decided I wanted to return to this topic. Uh, I have spoken about it before, but um, I know that we have some newer people that maybe haven't heard it before. And also, I felt like I had some additional things to say about it. Um, so, uh, I'm going to be speaking about the logical fallacy of the appeal to nature. Now, if you follow this uh, YouTube channel, if you follow what I say, you'll know that I'm a big fan of talking about logical fallacies because logical fallacies and identifying such can be extremely helpful in communication. If we understand the types of logical gaps that we make when we are trying to argue something or make a case for something and, and we avoid them, well, we can avoid confusion and then we can also more easily detect when people are making a logical error and what's at the root of their problem. You know, some things will just not sit well with us, but we may not be able to identify what exactly it is. Now, the appeal to nature is one that comes up a lot. In fact, uh, it's one of it's something that I find specifically with Christians. It could be a major problem. And let me explain why. OK, so imagine I'm saying a man has went on a search. He is going on some sort of sabbatical and he wants to be closer to God. He wants to try to build his relationship with God. And he's going to say, well, I'm going to build my relationship by, to God by moving, going to Yosemite for the weekend, right? Um, this would be considered a pretty normal response. Most people would think you know, going to Yosemite is a pretty typical thing somebody might do when trying to search for God. Now, if instead he said, 
I'm going to search for God, and I'm going to go see a production of Swan Lake. I'm going to go to a museum. I'm going to ride a roller coaster. I'm going to visit a big city. Uh, immediately, a lot of people might think that uh, this is not, in fact, something that really plays into um, – you know, getting closer to God. It does not seem to follow up. And I think one of the reasons why is because of this logical fallacy of the appeal to nature. It's sometimes known as the natural fallacy. Because the truth of the matter is, is you can, in fact, get closer to God by observing human behavior to a certain extent. After all, we are beings created in the image of God when you witness things like even artistic expression by other people, simply interacting with other people. If you go to Yosemite, there may not be much of an opportunity to talk to anybody else, right? It might be more of a private experience. Um, you know, it's uh, there, there is opportunity there that sometimes people don't think about. On the flip side, uh, the natural world is full of all kinds of sinful examples. This is, in fact, a fallen world. By observing nature, we're not just by necessity going to get closer to God in terms of learning ethical principles or moral principles necessarily because what we're going to observe is a fallen world in just as much as a, as a city life you know it's it does not matter you know you cannot escape from the demonic influence of this world right and uh, you know this is this is something that's really always uh, been the case. You know, the reason why we had to have a flood was because just generally speaking, the world is going in a very negative direction. And this is in both directions. This is not just, you know, let's be down on cities, let's be down on civilizations that reject God, but also the natural world does the same thing. It is really at odds with us in many ways. Because something is natural doesn't mean that it is justified, good, inevitable, or ideal. This is essentially the natural fallacy, right? The idea that just because something is the way we can observe it normally means the way that it should be. The truth is humans are evil, but really so is nature. Now, we all know humans are evil. It says so, you know, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? And so on and so forth. There are so many verses about the depravity of man. However, sometimes we can forget about the depravity of nature as well. Uh, as it says in Deuteronomy, it talks about what they had to face, you know. They, they went through the great and terrifying wilderness with its fiery serpents and scorpions and thirsty ground and all of this. You know, they were up against nature who was deliberately trying to make things difficult. A lot of the grumblings in the wilderness are just simple human needs, right? You know, the food doesn't, the, 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 the water doesn't taste good. Can we find water? You know, things like that. Um, because they were up against a very hostile environment, right? Uh, as it says in Genesis, you know, cursed is the ground because of you. Through toil, you will eat of it all the days of your life. You know, this is something that we have to face. The nature is not on our side. And it is not God's intention for it to operate the way it does, right? In terms of this is not the ideal. This is an example to us of a rebellious attitude that Adam and Eve presented it's also exemplified in what happened to nature itself. So in a sense, it does give us an example of morality, but you have to know how to parse that out, right? It's going to give you example of both. It will give you example of uh, the beauty of God, and we're going to get into that later on with our good news, but it also gives you an example of the rebellious attitude of man as well. You're not escaping that by going to nature is what I'm saying. Ultimately, you know, the, the, the picture, the millennial picture is not nature as we know about it now. You know, when it says, you know, the cow will feed with the bear and the lion will eat straw. This is not how nature is now. So if we're trying to get, you know, essentially closer to God by observing the world as it should be, going to nature is not going to really solve that problem. Now, that being said, another way that the natural fallacy can take into play is thinking that pervasive behavior is therefore the default, and then we can get lax about it. We can think, well, this is just the way that people tend to behave. This is also the way that nature tends to behave, right? We have a constant example in nature of a very hostile world where things are constantly in competition for one another and very predatory, and we can think, well, that's just kind of the way we should behave, right? We can observe mammalian species, and we can be like, well, that's just kind of the way that we are. We're 
animals too, right? Um, you know, boys will be boys. There's a truth to it in that we shouldn't be naive about human behavior and human depravity and what we would be naturally inclined to do without God, but that's not the same thing, obviously, as justifying any negative behavior, even the smallest uh, negative behavior. Um, as it says in Deuteronomy, uh, but he was warning them when they entered the land. He says, you know, when you enter the land, you shall not learn to imitate the detestable things of those nations, right? This is our natural inclination, is to be negatively affected by the people around us. But don't forget that you can be negatively affected by nature itself. Again, we don't have a better example with seeing, you know, these peaceful animal coexistence. That is kind of this fanciful idea of what nature represents that sometimes gets presented to us because people are anti-humanist or they're you know they have a they have an attitude that we're like a cancer on the earth or something like that and if we just got out of the way the earth would be a better place um uh, it says in Ephesians, you know, do not walk with the Gentiles in the futility of their mind. You know, we, we cannot follow the example of the other people. But again, this is something that nature itself does itself. Now, one thing to keep in mind is this is one reason why we have the example in Philippians and whatnot about reflecting on positive and reflecting on good. Uh, because you can, in fact, warp your view of reality. There are reports that say that people who consume a great deal of news literally have a warped view of reality in terms of the pervasiveness of things like murder and theft and things like that because news tends to want to talk about things that are interesting. Things that are interesting are not regularly happening, but because you hear about it all the time, you can get a warped idea of how often it is. And the problem with that is that with certain behaviors, it can make you start to want to think that those behaviors are either more acceptable or, you know, not as big of a deal as you might otherwise think. The issue is that sometimes when uh, people are looking at behavior, they kind of ask the question, am I acting normal? Which the Bible would dictate normal is actually not very good a lot of the time because our natural inclination is terrible, right? Um, and we certainly don't necessarily want to be peculiar either because that can indicate perhaps we've gone off the wrong track or something like that. But the point is, is that we can't just make the assumption that things as they are normally progressing are going well at all, that there's anything justifiable about it. And I think everybody understands that. I think where I think Christians tend to have the gap is, again, looking at nature. They tend to understand that about humans, but they tend to, in my opinion, overemphasize the perfection of nature in its current state. I don't think they often get quite, and they all also sometimes will get overly critical, in my opinion, of people as well. I think they can. They, there's a tendency for both. Now, the truth of the matter is, is artificial things can correct for a bad environment. We do it all the time. Uh, we build shelters so that we can protect ourselves from the elements. We wear certain types of clothing so that we can protect ourselves from temperature adjustments. We do this all the time, right? But a lot of times, especially in the Christian world, you can get this attitude. It's like, well, if God had intended it, wouldn't he have done it for us? Wouldn't this be the natural way it is? But the Bible constantly speaks to our need to be active participants in the redemption of the earth. And that goes beyond just helping others, but down to the natural world and things like that. Um <clears throat> We have made a lot of adjustments and advancements over the years that people sometimes neglect. When you go to the grocery store and you buy a peach, it doesn't look anything like it did 4,000 years ago. Now you can argue, well, was this the right thing? You know, is it higher sugar content or whatever? But the problem is, is sometimes people neglect all this history and then they're just looking at some of the artificial things we're doing now and they, re they approach it with a great deal of skepticism, neglecting all of the major impacts that humanity has done this entire time. I mean, this is a painting of watermelon back in the day. You can see it looks very different than watermelon does. Now, um, look at dogs. Dogs have been bred to do all different kinds of things for society and have been incredibly helpful. Um, you know, the common wolf can't be a seeing eye uh, assistant, you know, and that has benefited people and companionship and all kinds of things, right? Um, and I don't think that we should 
just by default think that this is some sort of rebellion against God. Instead, to me, this seems like an embracing of an appropriate way of having dominion over the earth. Instead of always thinking, you know, you can't do that and you're playing God, instead, we should recognize the fact that this is a fallen earth. And so by us intervening, we might in fact be, you know, um, we might in fact be fulfilling what God wants us to do. Well, it says, you know, we're going to have to toil with the ground, right? We have to wrestle with it. Well, that doesn't mean by making our life easier, we're somehow like trying to thwart something or, or break the system, right? <laughs> Overall, um, God told us to fill the earth and subdue it and to rule over these things. And there's a responsibility that comes with that, but there is an actual task that comes with that. We're not act, asked to be just passive you know, people on this earth assuming that the way that things currently are are the way they should be. <clears throat> now, that being said, you know, we do have rules within the Bible about things like the mixing of seeds and things like that that should give us caution when we are being involved in these things because there are moral principles at play and things like that. So I can understand when people raise an eyebrow for things like glowfish, where they've taken, you know, genetic information from bioluminescent animals and applied them to fish for no real good reason, except that they look pretty. Or even things like, um, you know, corn that you have to plant every year because they've patented the, the seed and things like that. There's obviously understandable questions and moral things that we can ask, right? My point is not that we can't ever question anything. My point is, is that our default response shouldn't be, well, that's not how God made it, therefore we shouldn't do anything. Because the current world is not how God made it. So that is not, that is the logical fallacy. All right, so in summary, my point is, is that humans are evil, but so is nature. Pervasive behavior doesn't make it right. This is true with either observing humans or nature, and you'll see bad examples in both. And um, we can, in fact, help nature out, get closer to what God intended through technology. And we shouldn't automatically assume that that is the wrong thing to do. And that will help us avoid uh, the fallacy of the appeal to nature. Sing the goodness of the Lord, the goodness of the Lord. I will sing forever of your love, O Lord. Through all ages my mouth will proclaim your truth. Of this I'm sure, that your love lasts forever. That your truth is established as the heavens. Forever I will sing the goodness of the Lord, the goodness of the Lord. Happy the people who acclaim such a God, who walk, O oh Lord, in the light of your face, who find their joy every day in your name, who make justice the source of their bliss. Forever I will sing the goodness of the Lord, the goodness of the Lord. For you, O oh Lord, are the glory of their strength. By your favor it is that our might is exalted. For our ruler is in the keeping of the Lord. Our King in the keeping of the Holy One of Israel. Forever I will sing the goodness of the Lord, the goodness of the Lord. There was a, a fellow who uh, had 
was driving out in the country and uh, he had uh, car trouble. Uh, so he was parked by a fence by a, a, a pasture there and there was a cow grazing next to the fence. And the cow shocked him. The cow began to talk and it said, check your alternator. Well, the guy was astounded. He, he jumped the fence, ran over to the, to the farmer's home, knocked on the door, and the farmer came to the door and he said, Sir, I've got, I've got to tell you an, an amazing story. There's a cow out there that can talk. The, car, the cow told me, check your alternator. So the farmer said, was it the cow that was grazing next to the fence? The guy says, yeah. So he said, ah, that's Molly. You can ignore her. She doesn't know anything about cars. <laughs> A psalm for the Sabbath day. You may remember last week I spoke about the temple. Uh, Herod's temple in Jerusalem uh, was a place where Jesus Christ came and taught. And he came there during the Festival of Tabernacles during his ministry. And he taught there. And he said in John 7 and verse 18, He who speaks from, him, uh, from himself seeks his own glory. But he who seeks the glory of the one who sent him is true. And no unrighteousness is in him. And so he was really implying here his own divinity because he was quoting from Psalm 92, verse 15. Let's go there to the, to the original statement in the Old Testament. To declare that the eternal is upright, he is my rock, and there is no unrighteousness in him. And of course, later on, Paul tells us how the rock symbolizes Jesus Christ also. So we have this scripture, which is found in Psalm 92. Now, back in ancient times, the priests and Levites had a psalm they recited for each day of the week. The Septuagint uh, talks of three of them. The Mishnah has all seven. Let's take a look at uh, what was done. The psalm for Sunday was Psalm 24. For Monday was Psalm 48. For Tuesday, it was Psalm 82. For Wednesday, it was Psalm 94. For Thursday, it was Psalm 81. For Friday, it was Psalm 93. There won't be a quiz afterwards like, <laughs> like what you had in Hebrews 11. And for Saturday, it was Psalm 92. Sa uh, so on the Sabbath, Psalm 92 was a psalm dedicated to be said on the Sabbath day, as you have in the, King, as you have in the Standard Bibles. That particular psalm is noted as the psalm of the Sabbath day in your Bibles that you're using. Let's go to, uh, uh, well, let's notice that, uh, uh, historically speaking, just as a cultural note, that to this day, Orthodox Jews, when they say their morning prayers, each day of the week, they recite the psalm for that particular day. Let's now talk about the psalm for the Sabbath day. A psalm or song for the Sabbath day is how it begins. Mizmor Shir Liyom HaShabbat. And then it goes on to say, It is good to give thanks to the Lord and to sing praises to your name, O Most High, to declare your loving kindness in the morning. In other words, when, when the times are bright and shiny, we declare God's, God's loving kindness and your faithfulness every night. In the dark times, we remember God's faithfulness. on an instrument of ten strings, on the lute and on the harp with harmonious sound. So we also praise God, of course, musically. And we do that here as, as best we can. For you, Lord, have made me glad through your work. I will triumph in the works of your hands. So each Sabbath we can look forward to the ultimate triumph of, of, of good over evil. My son, was uh, Daniel, was talking about the world as it is now. Sabbath helps us to look forward to the world as it will be. Oh, Lord, how great are your works. Your thoughts are very deep. It goes on to say, and we, we can think of God in the, in the amazing universe, the awe-inspiring universe. That we, it's unsearchable what's, what, what, just what's around us and what's out there. Or the subatomic world that we aren't able to see without instruments. That is also just a complex world that, that we're, you know, we, we, for much of history we weren't even aware of. A senseless man does not know, nor does, does a fool understand this. In other words, we, those people who, who, who are ignorant or choose to be, 
don't understand that there is a plan work, uh, working out here. There is a, a person of God who cares about you, human beings, and is working out a plan uh, for the betterment of human beings, for the ultimate wonderful good of human beings. A senseless man does not know, nor does a fool understand this. When the wicked spring up like grass, and when the, all the workers of iniquity flourish, it is that they may be destroyed forever. For, but you, O uh, Lord, are on high forevermore. So the wicked are just compared to grass. You know, it. it uh, if you, I don't know if we're going to see any, but it'll, yeah, right. It'll just, grass just comes and goes, and that's and the wicked uh, have no future. If they remain wicked, they have no future. For behold, your enemies, O Lord, for be enemy, your, holy, your enemies shall perish. All the workers of iniquity shall be scattered. But what of the righteous? You can go on to to read. But my horn, the psalmist says. You have exalted like a wild ox. I have been anointed with fresh oil. Uh, of course, we have the, the uh, symbolism of God's spirit compared to oil. My eye also has seen my desire, my enemies, my ears <coughs> hear my desire, the wicked who rise up against me. So ultimately, uh, our future, as if, if we remain in a right relationship with God through Jesus Christ, if we walk the walk, our future is to be kings and priests in God's kingdom. And as, it, as the uh, spirit beings in Revelation 5.10 recite or, or declare on behalf of human beings and have made us kings and priests to our God and we shall reign on the earth. Our character, if we're living a, a Christian life, our character uh, is like a tall, stately palm tree. And we have the permanence and, and magnitude of a palm tree. And uh, we can uh, re realize that there's nothing we take with us once we die other than the character that we have built with God's help. That remains. And another comparison is made the, the, with the righteous as the cedar in Lebanon. Those were the, probably in those in that region of the world the tallest and most stately trees, the tall stately palm tree and the famous cedar of Lebanon. Let's take a look at the verse. The righteous shall flourish like a palm tree. He shall grow like a cedar in Lebanon. We grow and we progress towards that goal. Those who are planted in the house of the eternal shall flourish in the courts of our God. They shall still bear fruit in old age. They shall be fresh and flourishing. They have the opportunity to pass on a heritage to their children and grandchildren and to look forward ultimately to immortality. The purpose ultimately is to declare that the eternal is upright as we heard earlier he is my rock and there is no unrighteousness in him as Jesus was with his disciples on the Sabbath walking through a field of grain he stated this which we see in Mark 2 27 and 28 and he said to them and to those around him because there was a dispute about what was or was not permitted on the Sabbath and he said to them, The Sabbath was made for man, and not man for the Sabbath. But the Sabbath, we see, was made for man. Therefore the Son of Man, Jesus Christ, is also Lord of the Sabbath. So Jesus Christ was the Word of God in the flesh, and he showed us how to keep the Sabbath. And Psalm 92, of course, is the Word of God in print. In 2 Corinthians 10, verse 5, we're told... No, this is well, John no, All right, let's go back and reinforce my point about Jesus Christ, who taught us about the Sabbath, that it was made for man. So therefore, he is Lord of the Sabbath. He can direct us in terms of how to observe the Sabbath properly, with respect, but not fanaticism. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And as I said a moment ago... Uh, he's the word of God in the flesh, and Psalm 92 is the word of God in print. And so we have the Bible. We have Jesus Christ's example is written in the Bible, and we have God's word directing us through the Bible. And in 2 Corinthians 10, 5, 
we're told, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. So Psalm 92 directs our thoughts on the Sabbath day, can guide us to have a more effective Sabbath. It is a psalm for the Sabbath day. We can now see in HD what was happening in the universe millions, even billions of years ago. NASA releasing more images from the James Webb Telescope full of cosmic beauty, showing a giant gaseous planet outside of our solar system, and two images of dying stars, also a cluster of thousands of galaxies dancing around each other. We might be seeing some of the very first stars and galaxies to form in this image. We need to, you know, download the data and start, you know, doing the precise measurements and figure it out. And that's what we're all eager to do. The nearly $10 billion telescope peering into the universe deeper than humanity has ever seen before. The use of infrared light spectrum allowing the telescope to see through cosmic dust. Today, for the first time, we're seeing brand new stars that were previously completely hidden from our view. You sort of get this sense of depth and texture from this new data. But as amazing as the discoveries have been, they are just the beginning. This Webb telescope will help scientists study the earliest galaxies and how our solar system formed and whether there is life on other planets. I mean, obviously, with all these sort of developments, you can't help but think of the psalm when it says that the heavens declare the glory of God um, and the expanse declares the work of his hands. I mean, when you think of the immense amount of space, it is one of the few ways that we can pretend to contemplate the concept of infinity and whatnot. So uh, regardless of your scientific take on uh, what exactly we should derive from such, it's certainly a wonderful thing when we can have more visual insight into what is going on uh, in the universe uh, around us. That being said, don't forget the scripture of the week, Psalm 55, 22. Cast your cares on the Lord and he will sustain you and he will never let the righteous fall. Restore us, O oh God, let your face shine, that we may all be saved. Restore us, O oh God, let your face shine, that we may like a flock enthroned upon the cherubim shine forth shine before Ephraim and Benjamin and Manasseh we pray stir up your might and come to save save us restore us O oh God let your face shine Bread of tears, drink deep. So we're the scorn of our neighbors, Lord. Our enemies, they laugh. Restore us, God of hosts, let your face shine. Restore us, oh God. Let 
let your face shine that we may all be saved they've burned it all with fire lord and they have cut it down may they perish at rebuke of your countenance but let your hand be on the one the one at your right hand the one whom you made strong for yourself Please like, subscribe, hit the bell for this YouTube channel. It's very helpful to us. And uh, we will see you in the future.